So everybody is always wondering about be, about how to be your own boss. And there's a few simple ways you can do this. One is don't work for somebody else. Two, do what you love. And three, whatever you do, <laughs> and make sure it's not for the man. So those three things will make it a lot easier to build wealth for yourself, whether that be financial wealth or um, an object wealth or property wealth. And um, there's so many different ways you can do this and you do not need a lot of federal reserve notes to do so. So for example, we bought land on auctionaz.com, uh, two acres for $600 and now we have land that's paid for. Um, we have a Winnebago that we did a work trade for, so our house is paid for. Um, I quit my slave job over four years ago, so technically I'm retired. I still work, but all of the work I do has to do with liberty, freedom, and um, creating a more free society for the next generation. Um, you can do markets and you can have an online website. You could have a merchandise store. You can make bracelets. You can make drinks. You can make anything you want. Um, but the how is even more simple than you would imagine because it's a switch in your mind that you flip. So instead of now thinking that you need to work for somebody else to survive, you realize within yourself that you don't, that you can do it on your own. And it's your lifestyle choices that will limit how, how wealthy you become. Um, and really wealth is subjective anyway. So, all right, well, I just wanted to give you all an update and explain to you how I've been my own boss for four years now. Now really, Neo is my boss and I will never again be my own boss. So uh, yeah, because once you have a child, that pretty much changes everything. And which is good because this really is all about the next generation and what we can create for them so that they have choices and that they can um, make those choices without being aggressed upon in any way, shape, or form. So have a wonderful day. Peace out from the Freedom Ranch. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT No Gov License allows use or modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and thesseedsofliberty.com. So today we have Alma Summer coming in from Arizona. She's um, the founder of jackalopefreedomfestival.com. She also has undocumentedhuman.com and agorismarketplace.com, as well as homestead.guru. Uh, you can find those on Facebook as well. Under those names, um, Jackalope Freedom Festival, Undocumented Human, and Agorist Marketplace. Um, do you have the Homestead Guru on Facebook? Yes. You do too? Okay, so that one too. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we're going to talk about a little bit about her background uh, to volunteers and how she came to that. And and also um, about her son, Neo. Cool name, by the way. Really love it. <laughs> um, and how he is undocumented, right? No social security number, no 
birth certificate, which is really awesome. Uh, I tried to have that with my uh, my kids, and uh, it was tough, 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 man. But my wife, uh, she backed out last minute. Um, you know, we, we, we didn't vaccinate, you know, and uh, we did the water birth and everything. But uh, And even, even the fact that we did it at home, the second one was at home. But, uh, but yeah, we... Uh, uh, I guess I guess if you, even if you do it at home, I guess you have to mail in the own thing about the social security. I don't know, but yeah. So I'm really delighted to talk to you about that. So please talk to us about that and uh, and uh, what that entails. And uh, if you're getting pursued by people, <laughs> <clears throat> hope not. No, I'm not being pursued uh, unless I speak somewhere and then someone comes up and talks to me about how their situation is similar. Then they pursue me, but no like status pursuing me awesome um so anyway we wait we plan on having neo at home and i think next my next child i won't even have a licensed midwife it's more of like a you know it's your first kid so you want to make sure you're safe hmm. yeah. i think it's fear that makes you choose having a midwife at right. all even and there's other organizations that exist um that have like um well, they're not midwives anymore, so they're whatever they call themselves, ex-midwives or just something else now. Mm. And you can um, go through them and they will help you have a child. So I don't think it's completely necessary to have a licensed midwife. In fact, I feel like they've been fear-mongered by the state and all their rules going through the licensing process that they're so hands-off. And I don't want that type of experience bringing my child into the world. So... I would really, I want like more of those, more women around too, probably. So, because it is like a long experience. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. The, the woman that we, uh, that we use for both my kids, uh, 2000, well, first one, 2010, the second one, 2012. Um, she was, she's like, I think she's in her 60s. And, uh, and she had birthed at that time like a, a little over 3,000 babies <clears throat> over 30 years. Uh, including her own two grandchildren, <laughs> she helped to birth, which is really awesome. So uh, uh, a lot of experience with with the woman, and uh, and she did primarily water birth, which is really awesome. We did first one was water birth at the hospital, and the second one was water birth at home, and they're both awesome experiences. You know, <clears throat> even though that the hospital was still like in a birthing room, so it was like separate, not you know with the stalls and you know and everything. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, uh, she was really great and. Uh, and uh, we we definitely recommend her, <clears throat> uh, but yeah, midwives are awesome. And and I do know one midwife. Like I don't know if you know Melissa Rakovich from Facebook. I'm sure you've seen her around. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's it's she. Wait. Rachel. No, not Rachel. No, uh, Mel uh, Rak Ma Melissa. Melissa Rakovich. Her last name R A J K O V I C H. I'm thinking of someone else. Okay. Yes. Yes. So she. Um, uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna probably start another podcast with her on peaceful parenting, but um, but she went through the training of being a midwife, and then she stopped primarily because of what you said, all the uh, the regulations, the rules, and all the stuff they have to go through. And she's like, "No, I'm not gonna do that." And uh, <clears throat> and I think that she wants to just learn the craft, maybe apprentice under somebody, and then practice like that. So yeah, <laughs> I had a really nice midwife at the hospital when. Um, I chose that hospital because they have midwives. So once I got there, I was assigned a new midwife. And my midwife at that point was like out of the picture completely. So. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's, it's interesting how you say like the, uh, they're, they're, a lot of them are afraid to be hands on because of, uh, I guess, legal um ramification or you know repercussions that may ensue as a result of what happens. But yeah, it's so ridiculous. It's like, um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, like you said, I mean, if if the woman feels relaxed, you know, and you feel relaxed with the person, you you, you know the person, <clears throat> like I don't know, you, you just the state just messes up everything. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <clears throat> so when we were when we were there, and I I hate hospitals, but and and if anyone has a baby in a hospital or they have to or whatever, you know, whatever, you go to the hospital. I had to. I knew it was stuck inside me. I had to have a cesarean. So uh... it was like I got there and. They were like, okay, you know, we went through the options and I opted for the epidural, which I get why women do that now. You know, you don't feel anything. There's no other drug that makes that pain go away. It's only the epidural that makes mm. the pain go away. Uh. And even after having that 
and like laying me on my side and still didn't want to come out. And then they noticed that his heart rate was acting funny. And um, I guess they had blood tested us and then we were both septic. And I think that was because we were in the tub and the tub wasn't like a filter. It didn't have like a filtration system. So I definitely want like things um, just more clean and the next time around too. Mm. So, mm. you know, I just want to eliminate as much like uh, bacteria as possible. So it's just, I think it's important. And, uh, and also to be able to like get out of the tub and go back in the tub and just things like that too. I, I think maybe a birthing center might be something I'll choose. Um, but then again, I just don't know. I don't know what that's going to be like either. Um, so anyway, uh, Neo, he at one point became like they kept, you know, they come into the room and they check on his heart rate, and and this woman kept checking on his heart rate for like a really long time, and I'm like, what is wrong with him? And what I was going to say is that I think it's important to not put your baby in that bath and that thing just like keep him or her with you all of the time it doesn't matter you're not going to roll over on them you just had a you know it's just the babies come out of you some way you're not feeling like laying on your stomach or you know anything crazy like that so um they took neo to the nursery okay let me take a step back when i was on the epidural i made a comment in the room about um being forced to fill out paperwork and somebody told on me at that point, they went and told um, the social, the social workers there, somebody from the state, because the next day when they took Neo to the nursery because of his weird heartbeat um, to put him on a, um, an EKG, they, they put the things all over him just to keep monitor his heart. Mm. And they took him in there and I got, was getting some rest. And one of the nurses told Brian that, a social worker planned to come and talk to us because of the comment I had made while in like emergency or whatever. And so at that moment I like had prepared some questions for the social worker. So I, you know, could speak to her articulately and she, you know, didn't try and attack me in any way. And, and I tried to relate with her right away. So, um, but while in nursery, they told Brian, oh, well, I think he's just dehydrated. And so they convinced him to give to give him um, Monsanto GMO formula because he's dehydrated. Mm-hmm. And I had told Brian, you know, come and get me if he needs a nurse, whatever, you know. And I know you're like a brand new mom and you're not producing like a lot of milk, but it's still important that they get whatever they can from you rather than some other source. Right. And that's another thing is like, they don't have other women's breast milk in there. Like so many women would donate their breast milk to newborn babies whose mothers, you know, weren't giving their babies the hydration that they, that they needed. And I got really upset about it that, that he had done that without coming to talk to me. And he, he felt really bad after he was like doing the research on whatever they gave him. And, he wishes he could go back but anyway so the nurse who had convinced him she also felt really bad because I was upset about this decision that they had made without me and one of my friends came to visit and she was also nursing and this nurse let my friend pump milk for me and she hooked us up and she gave us um some of our labels and containers so that I could put my name on these containers and put, and they store them in the fridge for you there. Mm. And the ner- the night nurse that night didn't say anything, which I'm sure she must have noticed. Cause you can tell the colors different. The amount is different. Like mm. there's no way I was producing that. Um, but the <laughs> fact that the nurse made this decision, right. By like allowing this to happen was the, coolest thing she could have ever done and um i really appreciated that so neo was not dehydrated he ended up you know being fine and after they let him come back to me i didn't let him leave me i slept yeah 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 it's such a strange thing they take the child away it's like it's like those those first you know 15 minutes they say are the most important you know the bonding experience like um like i remember this was later this was like a like a day later though 
but I did get a hold of him right away after. Oh, oh, they, oh, after a day they took. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, this was later when they came to check on him, like in our room. Oh, okay. But no, I did get a hold of him right away. But after having a cesarean, you're like shaky. And yeah, I was yeah. drugged up. Yeah, and definitely. It, you can't even barely hold him. You're like open. It's horrible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah I, I remember um, li- listening to uh, or reading a story about like when when if cats that have uh, you know a litter of, of kittens um and and if they're if the kittens are taken away like within the first you know 15 minutes um after that you know you, they give the kittens back and the mother cat does not acknowledge the kitten at all that like doesn't even acknowledge the existence of the kitten doesn't nurse nothing anything and the kit you know the kittens often die as a result so uh yeah it's it's, it's so amazing it's so important and amazing how how important those first few moments are uh i'm glad know. we've evolved <laughs> past being a cat yeah, <laughs> definitely. But but yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I learned, you know, having, uh, you know, uh, having these, having these two kids, and you know, witnessing my wife going through the pregnancy and the birth, and I'm like, I talk to a lot of women. Whenever I meet them about when they're pregnant, I'm like, so you're gonna do water birth? <laughs> I just say it outright. <clears throat> they're like, no, why? What's that? <laughs> You know, that's probably why the state tries to get the guys at 18 because the chances of them having witnessed their significant other going through birth is is very low. Mm. Unless you have a teenage pregnancy, which, right. hey, all for those. Go for those. Plus, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. people want to go to war after seeing a child come out of another human. Like, come on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, or yeah. if men start having babies themselves, that'd be awesome. <laughs> right, right. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Like, like with me, everywhere I go as a homeschooling father, I'm always the only father there. You know, I'm surrounded by mothers and their kids, and, and I, I like it. You know, I'm, I'm comfortable. Um, <clears throat> and and you're right. I think I think uh, you know, the more people have kids, you know, the, the less likely they're going to want to go off and die for you know politicians and bankers and. <laughs> <laughs> it's like why, <laughs> but uh, but then again, we need to convince them to breed out statism before they graduate high school. <laughs> yeah, that's actually the way I look at voluntarists uh, and anarchists and peaceful people who practice peaceful parenting. Is that we're, you know, there's one there's one way to try to defeat statism is to talk to people who are already uh, you know supportive of of government and and a belief in authority. But then another way is to just raise peaceful compassionate gentle kind human beings and in that way like you said breeding out the evil folks <clears throat> or the misguided so folks. so my maybe. sign outside the high school sh- high school should say quit high school choose peace yeah yeah definitely <laughs> so so uh, so, yeah, so, so so give me a little background about uh your introduction to volunteerism and anarchy okay well, I started in, I guess, 07 with the Ron Paul movement. And in Phoenix, there's a guy named Ernest Hancock who has a show called Declare Your Independence with Ernest Hancock. And his website's freedomphoenix.com. He had a workshop in Phoenix where a lot of activists hung out and met each other. And so once I found out about that, I was pretty much in the loop. Um, there's still a lot of activists I meet out here that were in the valley at the same time that uh, woke up at the same time, went through the same process, started their own little um, agorist businesses or organizations or non-governmental organizations, and now I'm still just meeting them. So it's a very large network of liberty people in Arizona. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, and, uh, and when did you start the Jackalope Freedom Festival? So I went to Fork Fest in 2011. And I kept hearing all about Kat, Kat Bleich's speech the year before about how she's an anarchist. And, no. and I kept, you know, hearing that maybe next year uh, Pork Fest was going to become a 5013C. And, and I was learning about copyleft and, you know, all that stuff. Like in 2011, I was really just like inundated with a lot of Liberty stuff there. Mm-hmm. And I came up with the slogan silly status taxes are for slaves Mm -hmm. and i made a big 
um, poster board and my friend Ashley like went around giving out free hugs all that year wearing this poster board. Mm -hmm. Well, that was like the first motto for Jackalope, but Jackalope wasn't even Jackalope at the the time. I just knew that Arizona needed to have a festival like Pork Fest, but without any group of people in charge. And we needed to find a place where we could have it free. People could camp for free and vend and attend. And there's no fees of any kind or registration just because all of that stuff. Um, uh, what, I don't know what the word is. It just like, it slows things down and stops progression from happening. And I'm even, I encourage people to come up with their own idea call it whatever they want, advertise it however they want, and then still advertise it the same dates in the same place. Hmm. So, cool. you know, I, I copy left Jackalope even. It used to, the first, um, the first, what was, what is it, mascot was a, like a porcupine with a scorpion tail. So it was a scorpupine. Cool. And that's what the group on Facebook is actually called. But then in the beginning, the people that were in the group started talking and somehow Jackalope became the name. And I used to have a, another motto on there where statism comes to die and the free market prevail. Yeah. But it was kind of harsh. And so then it, it changed to um, where spontaneous order happens naturally without any force, coercion, or aggression. Nice. See, how can you be against that, right? <laughs> That's yeah. beautiful. <clears throat> yeah, I love this. I, I love all these festivals popping up. There's the uh, what is it, the, the 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 one with Lou Fien. I forget what what it's called. The, the one that he has up um, in the Midwest, right? Uh, Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest. Right. There's that one. Yeah. And then they got the Porcupine, uh, and and then there's Liberty Fest that I went to in Brooklyn, and uh, and the. Um, uh, the Pork Fest. Yeah, Liberty Fest I've been to twice. That's the only Liberty Festival I've been to. Um, and uh, I met a lot of great people there. Jeffrey Tucker, Luke Rodowski, um, Katie, Katie Chaos, and Rob Murphy, and Tom Woods. And so, so it was really, really awesome to meet these people that you've, you know, you only read their blogs or listen to their podcasts or read their books and finally like, oh, they're a real human being. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yep. Yep, I met Luke at the Axum conference in Utah like eight years ago. Nice. That was one of our first little activist road trips. I went on with um, my friends, Drew Phillips and Nick Barnett and Jet. We all went to Utah. It was fun. Yeah, well, what's amazing about Luke is he's like like last year he was he was twenty eight years old I think he told me and and uh, like the guy's so young and he's done so much already and he's just he's just a really busy guy traveling all over the world and taking some off, you know awesome shots and doing some great stuff <clears throat> on uh, yeah follow him on Snapchat you get even more <clears throat> oh, I, don't, I don't even have Snapchat <laughs> I don't have Luke Snapchat. we are change <laughs> I don't have Snapchat I don't have Instagram I'm sorry I'm behind the times I'm sorry. <laughs> Snapchat's, Snapchat's cool, and so is Periscope. You would probably really dig Periscope. In fact, there's, like, um, some adults on there who do shows that are about, like, awareness and the younger generation having access to things like Periscope and their parents aren't aware of it and don't know about it. And <laughs> Like, even one of my friends said to me, oh, Snapchat's for teenagers, and I said, if that's what you think, <laughs> you're... <laughs> You should go check your child's phone. <laughs> no, don't go check your child's phone. Just like, you know, whatever. Whatever your 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 relationship with your child is, you know, your <laughs> choice. But I'm sure if she realized what you could do with Snapchat, I mean, I don't know, maybe she would. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that, uh, you know, what parents, uh, you know, like the technology is getting so so expansive and and you know there's so many possibilities that parents are, so, are often so way behind the times in terms of technology and the kids become teachers of the parents um and and that's what i i hope for my kids to do for me like like i know all this stuff we know that as, as much as i know i don't know a lot but but I'm, i assume my kids are going to be teaching me stuff about how to use on the internet and that's cool you know i can't wait for that day <clears throat> i think uh i think that's one of the one of the parts of peaceful parenting is uh being humble enough to say that um, my kids can teach me something, right? And it's and it's not like a position of authority. With, with, with it seems a lot of parents like to take is that you have to listen to what I say because I'm more experienced. I know more and everything. 
and uh, and it's so sad, you know, that people because then the kids get like you know become felt like inferiors and subjects, and you know that they don't know, you know, they feel dumb and stupid and all that, and and it's just so sad, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I have some good friends that ha- are our age, and they have teenage boys, so they had kids that's a lot younger, and it's just kind of cool to have friends my age but have grown kids. And they're like almost adults, and it's just nice to have the uh, get their experience and and just their knowledge of you know what they've been through. Yeah. So so tell me a little. they're anarchists. <laughs> oh, they are. Oh, cool. That's even better. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I don't hang out with that many statists. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, that's the thing. It's like, um, you know, like uh, you know, we're, we're living with my family right now, and uh, it's uh, it's all right. You know, if, uh, I've uh, come to peace. You know, come to terms with certain differences that I have. My mother's a Bernie Sanders supporter. Uh, most of my families are Democrats, uh, so they love Barack Obama. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah. Um, you know, I've gotten into heated debates with my mother, but over time, I'm like, eh, you know, she's not going to change. I'm not going to change. Eh. <laughs> so what just, state are you in? Uh, New York. People's so Republic. you're by the ocean, yeah? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. could get a sailboat. True. You could put your family on a sailboat. Actually, we're thinking about, you know, we're thinking about, uh, cause, uh, you know, we had a, we had a mortgage in Long Island for six years. Worst, well, one of the worst decisions of of our lives. Um, we we lost a massive amount of money, you know, because we 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 got the mortgage right before the housing bubble burst in two thousand eight. So everything was overvalued, and then we lost all this massive amount of value, and it never recovered. And so we had to sell it uh, at a loss, major loss, which really sucked. Um, so yeah, learned big lesson, big economics lesson, you know, painfully through that, and. Uh, and yeah, so now we're now you know either like renting or RV, like you know what you guys are doing. So I think uh, that that's a possibility. Or sailboat, you could do a work trade for a sailboat. <laughs> or a sailboat. All right, that's interesting. We did idea. a work trade for our motorhome. I'm not. Uh, I haven't been on too many boats, so I'm not like uh, super comfortable on the water. <laughs> uh, I, I like to, I, I like the land to be a little more firm, you know, under my feet. <laughs> Or just take some diving lessons because if you did sail, you're going to want to dive. That's, I mean, if uh, you're out on the ocean, you're going to want to dive, right. free dive, right. scuba dive. You know, you're definitely going to want to swim well. Yeah, yeah. So if you, if you, if, you know, there's some, okay, so like you're going to take some, you know, lessons probably before you make that plunge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, li- literally and figuratively. Yeah, that plus. <laughs> I'm ready. Like, bring on the sailing. I'm ready to go. I'm I'm scuba certified, and I love the ocean and wow. swimming and wow. all of it. So you have a lot so of ex- Brian. you have a lot of experience with boats, boating also. Uh, well, yeah, we've been in the Virgin Islands twice, which is if we ever escaped this big island, we would probably head there. Oh, really. <laughs> Yeah. Plus, like, I, it's probably one of the only places far enough away from this big island we could take Neo without too much difficulty. Cool. Yeah, yeah. We're thinking about um, yeah places to move, like um, Asheville um, and uh, maybe maybe New Hampshire, um, but but it's too cold up there. So maybe Asheville. <laughs> Asheville is nice. <laughs> Nice bunch of peaceful parenters down there and volunteers, and uh, so I like that a lot. So I think it's important to have community. You know, people like my my sister in law. She was uh, asking me, you know, do you really like Asheville? Like, like, what if you don't like the mountains or the weather or something? And I'm like, you know, I can live anywhere, right? It doesn't matter where a location is for me. For me, what makes a place attractive is the people. You know, the yeah. networks, the community, that's what makes it attractive. Forget about the weather. Forget about the, forget about everything else. Like you can adapt. You can, you can, you know, make a warm home, whatever you can adapt. But if you don't have a network of people that is there for you, that will come to your aid, you know, that's, that's a hard life the way I look at it. <laughs> right. Totally. Yeah, totally. I, as you're talking about this, I just keep thinking about Texas because we have a very large network of liberty friends there too and um it's always an option in our family's life that we might head to texas so yeah they think again <laughs> oh you you grew up there no no no. we went there for um the texas uh, bitcoin uh conference but okay. but um on the undocumented human bitcoin tour we oh. uh, went to texas when neo was just like six months <laughs> oh, okay 
Before we had the RV, we traveled in our um, Jeep and we pulled a trailer because we had moved out of our apartment and we had like a third of our stuff with us. It was crazy. Uh huh. And we camped, and we it's so beautiful up in northern Arizona, northern New Mexico, into Texas. Mm -hmm. There's so many open pieces of property. You could just go and, like, squat and live yeah. there or boondock or whatever you word you want to use that's, like, appropriate for your life. Um, Michael Fielding just came out with a new video, uh, Sailboat Diaries, that's oh, a yeah. YouTube channel. Oh, that's right. And it's Squatting yeah. 101, and it's actually really good. So, Yeah, I first heard about him. Uh, Jeff Berwick interviewed him on Anarchast, and uh, yeah, really awesome guy. Uh, he, he he did the video with, uh, like, what was he, like on an island for like 100 days or something like that? Was, I think it was 30 days. 30 days, okay. But, but he uh, sailed around yeah. all over the Caribbean and didn't check in and didn't get permission, and he was completely left alone. Oh, yeah? Cool. Yeah. There's a um, Patreon called SV Delos. They've been sailing for like five or seven years. Uh -huh. They've been on Patreon pretty much since the beginning, and they make, you know, $5,500 a video. So they're uh -huh. doing really well. And the guy who owns the sailboat, he's actually from Flagstaff because I've watched like all of their videos. Mm. And I wrote them the other day asking them like, where's the most like free place you could sail around and not have to check in, you know, because I mentioned rural. You can see I'm writing on there from Undocumented Human, our Patreon, and you can, you know, see who it is. And he's like, that's an interesting question. Oh, I don't know who actually responded because they have a crew of like seven people. It could have been any one of them responding. Mm -hmm. But they were like, that's an interesting question. And then they told me, I think their answer was the Philippines. I'd have to go check. But I think that's what they told me. Sailing around there, that was like the least regulated uh, place to sail around. Cool. And they've been all over the world. Yeah. Their videos are awesome. So are they um, anarchist volunteers? I don't know what they are. <laughs> they definitely film without like getting permission because they document their travels. Ah, okay, but they're okay. like six months behind on their videos because they'll sometimes throw a date in there or say what <laughs> holiday it is or what's going on or when it was filmed even. They just like tell you. Um, and there's a lot of other Patreons like that, that are six months behind, three months behind. Some people are kind of quicker with their videos and they're only, you know, three weeks behind, which I, my videos are probably anywhere from like three weeks to like two months behind. <laughs> my footage is from like all different t time periods. So does so not, not chronological is what you're saying. Not really. <laughs> it's, it's not the best. I'm not the best, you know, documentary edit, editing, filmer, whatever person. But I'm doing what I I enjoy, and I share the videos with a few people before I put them out there. And if they ever told me it was total crap, then I probably would do a different video. But I usually get somewhat decent responses. Yeah, and we have three Patreons. Nice. So. And I switched my campaign. I'm, I switched it to per video instead of per month. So now I'm making eight dollars per video. Ah, see, I gotta. I and actually, that's that's what, sorry. That's when my mo my most recent video actually talks about the research that I did before I launched our Patreon and how I found that Patreons who choose a per video campaign um, usually don't charge their patrons more than three times a month. So if you put out three awesome videos, mm -hmm. then you can charge three times. If you start doing more than that, then people will probably, you know, well, it's it's still their choice in the back end how many videos they um, pledged to you, yeah. so or they yeah. pledge for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they can still choose. I'm just going to pledge one video a month to this person. Oh, okay. But I think so far I'm still per video eight dollars. Cool. Nobody's changed it since i switched the campaign and all of my research was per video anyway so um yeah it's just kind of hard because sometimes wi-fi isn't the best and uploading mm -hmm. a long video 13 minutes can be rough yeah <clears throat> yeah i got into i got into patreon a couple of months ago um i uh yeah so far i have just one patreon <laughs> one patron 
Um, and I think it's it's per month. Maybe I should change it to per video. Uh, I'll, I'll try to look into your advice. It sounds like a good advice. Um, but yeah, I gotta get get rolling on that. Uh, but so uh, when you when you go and post on your Patreon, you choose if you're charging your patrons or not. So you can just charge them three times a month, and then everything else you do, all the rest of your content is free. Okay. All right. Cool. I like that. Because <clears throat> um, so, I just think that more people would be willing to pay more times a month than not. So you're giving your patrons the opportunity to pay more money to you that mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. That, that's how I see it. All right. Cool. I gotta, yeah, look into that. <clears throat> Definitely. Um, so yeah, so please go into a little bit about your undocumentedhuman.com and uh, what that's about. All right. Well, it's basically, it, it's, not much of a website it just has some basic information on there and um i suppose in the future i'll probably link to things like emancipated human and world citizen and you know if i had an assistant or a nanny or and or you know any kind of volunteer that just wants to like learn from me welcome <laughs> welcome to our family <laughs> we travel <laughs> nice <laughs> Yeah, I could use all the help I could get because once you have kids, you pretty much get like 50% done of what you used to as a human being. And, oh, uh, so true. That's not in the book. So true. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, pr- productivity goes way down. Um, energy goes way down. Sleep often goes way down. <laughs> a lot of stuff goes way down. Um, but kids are beautiful, though. I, you know, recommend kids. Recommend people have kids. Definitely, it's a wonderful thing. Bring life. Join into- the crazy train. <laughs> <laughs> Bring life into the world. Um, <clears throat> I was listening to one uh, you know, Stephen Molyneux podcast, and he was saying how um, it's a strange thing that uh, that some people complain of. Like, uh, you know, they say, "Well, I don't want to have kids because um, you know overpopulation. It's such an evil world, and you know, it's a lot of cruelty and hatred. And why am I going to bring my child into in a world like this?" And uh, and what's funny is, uh, what he, he said um, that the intelligent people are the people that think about the future, right? And 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 that um, they don't just think about now and the present and you know um, their current desires. They think about the future and like the you know the national debt. I guess basically you know you know liberty minded people <laughs> think about the future, long term consequences, right? And so those are the kind of people that would say, you know what, I don't want to bring my child into this. So those are the people who would breed less. And the people who don't think as much, a little bit more dull, simple-minded, you know, they're like like rabbits, you know, like 10 kids, 15 kids. And, and, it's, and it's, it's crazy. It, it, like, if you think about it like that, it's like, man, idiocracy is not a far-off <laughs> dream. <clears throat> so I, I, I do think it's interesting how people, like, they were overpopulated and that were starving or whatever. I mean, in America, there is there nowhere's overpopulated but the cities. Right. Believe. Exactly. Exactly. And um, there are food banks all over the place that are giving away free food. Churches and nonprofits of all kinds. Mm-hmm. In Arizona, there's if someone is starving, it's because they're choosing not to eat. Mm. Good point. <laughs> and uh, I mean, there's like, I, I hear about homeless, like communities popping up all over the place. They're not starving. They're being fed somehow. Mm-hmm. They're getting food from food banks, most likely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, and also it's, um, you know, overpopulation, it's, it's a strange thing when, when you think about just the, just the, the land mass that comprises the United States alone, it's like what, like, like 95 or 90, 95%, you know, uninhabited <laughs> regions, you know, it's like, what, what overpopulation, what are you talking about? <laughs> it is a lie. You know, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's just yeah, just uh, along the same lines as you know, climate change, global warming, and and uh, you know all this kind of stuff. Uh, um, you know, like let's just, talk it's, about fiat currency, fear mongering, the Federal Reserve. You know, like something yeah, real. Yeah, it's fear mongering. It's it's just you know, it's basically for me the foundation of statism. Right? It's based on fear and uh, and uh, <clears throat> and and just uh, fear of the unknown. Basically, fear of your neighbor, fear of other countries, other religions, other genders. You know, fear of the poor, fear of the rich, fear of everybody. <laughs> Um, and, and it's so fear of running out of space and then you choose to live in the city and like you have like all these people stacked on top of you <laughs> and you're like oh my god we're running out of space yeah you are 
You are running out of space. Leave the city. Yeah. I know. I know. I, I, uh, yeah, I could never live in the city. Uh, my, my sister-in-law lived in the city for maybe like a, two years. Oh, my God. It's so claustrophobic. And I don't know. I don't know what you and they're like. Well, it's so awesome because you walk out and you have all this, uh, you know, businesses and luxury. And I guess that's true. But uh, I don't know. You sacrifice a lot. And every time I drive to a city, well, because like, I drive past Manhattan occasionally, and I often get a headache just driving past Manhattan. <laughs> so, do you sit at red lights during the day? I, oh, in, in the city, you mean? I mean, uh, during the day where you are now, yeah, do you sit at red okay, lights occasionally. See, I still consider that in the city. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm in the suburbs, maybe like 45 minutes north of Manhattan. Um. But how many uh, red lights do you have to sit at to drive around town? Uh, eh, it's a good amount. <laughs> I mean, a couple, a couple. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's a good point though. Yeah, you know, another thing I, 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 uh, I remember reading, which is an interesting point is that every time you see a traffic jam, that's a government line. <laughs> right? I know people just drive on the sidewalks or the dirt road on the side or whatever's there and just go around and sitting in these lines. Seriously, your livestock leave. Yeah. Like I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I just, I like to imagine you know, like how would if if you know if if the roads were truly privatized, you know, I I I really think traffic would be a thing of the past. I mean, we probably have you know flying cars by now or teleportation down pat, but but you know we would have no no traffic. Do, <laughs> Go ahead. We do have flying cars. We have ultralights. We have the Pal V, and there's like many more. Yeah, I did see. Actually, you're right. I did see one uh, of uh, yeah, like like pr- like prototypes of like flying cars or something. Uh, and the only way that we're going to be flying cars around in the future is if we stop being slaves and stop asking permission. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. That, that's 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 one thing that I um, I like to tell business owners. Uh, like like for example, what um, Airbnb, what uh, Uber did, what Lyft did. Um, you know, all these companies. They didn't ask permission, right? They just started. Like they didn't ask, you know, is there regulations that we have to comply with? Do we have to pay certain taxes? <laughs> they just started their business, right? No permission. And then it was up to the regulatory agencies and the states. They're like, wait a minute, hold on. These people are conducting businesses and they're not being taxed. What are you going to do about this? <laughs> so There's an Uber <laughs> alternative called Arcade. Oh, I can't remember the second. It's two words and it's arcade something. So look it up. The Daily Decrypt did a video about it. Cool. He interviewed the guy. It's completely free and they take cryptocurrencies. I mean, uh, you don't have to like pay like pay to whatever sign up or anything like that. Right, right. Um, and they're going to like offer different services as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm really getting into Bitcoin more and more. Um, I, uh, I I just got into WatchMyBit.com. You, you heard of that? That website, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah the, I was talking to Doug Scribner a couple of days ago, and he was helping me upload my first video onto there, and uh, and I saw a video about how, <clears throat> you know, it's it's so much better than something like Netflix or Hulu, right? Because it's like truly international, right? Bitcoin recognizes no boundaries or borders, um, and uh, and just anybody can get on there and <clears throat> you know pay per view, and uh, and people already pay for services like that, so why not use something like something awesome like cryptocurrency? I wish Watch My Bit would let me put a free video up so that I don't have to advertise just on YouTube. I can actually advertise, like I send people there to watch that free video. But it's the only paid watching site. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's just, yeah, paid. Well, I mean, you, you could put a, a an excerpt, a snippet, like a one minute or something like that. <clears throat> um. That's free? Yeah, that people can watch like a one minute like you put your video and then they can watch a one minute snippet for free and then if they want to pay for it they watch the you know the whole thing. Um but uh, okay, but yeah, that might be a new new feature then and that's definitely um that gives you more incentive, you know, to yeah. watch the video for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty awesome like uh like my wife my wife was asking me like who's going to go on there and and pay to watch these videos i'm like well you're already paying netflix right you're already paying this these services so what? and patreon you're paying your you're you're pledging to your content creators on patreon that's exactly what it's for yeah there i mean i want but patreon i can go and post blogs on there and send 
people directly to Patreon and they can watch the video from Patreon and they don't have to pay anything. So I'm like sharing this platform for free with people whenever I share the link, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I just want to be able to offer free things and, you know, not free things. Mm -hmm. So that's what Patreon did. And there definitely needs to be a cryptocurrency platform like Patreon and Periscope. So what is Periscope? I never, I never heard of that one. Is that a, I don't think that's new, right? So you can sit there and do your show or talk to people and they, you can't hear them, um, but they can hear you and they, they type in the chat box and then you basically choose to respond to whatever you're seeing in the chat box. Ah, okay. <clears throat> so, so it's for like YouTubers and podcasters and things like that? And kids. And kids. <laughs> Lots of kids. Okay. Lots of kids. I've seen like a nine-year-old in there doing makeup. She knew exactly what she was doing. It was Periscope. Her mom walks in, and she shuts it off. And I'm like, oh, my God. Her mom gave her a smartphone, and then she knows about Periscope. So she goes, downloads the app, and then signs in, logs in. Like, she figures it out. She's nine. What the heck? Yeah, At I think she wasn't doing anything inappropriate because <laughs> there's creeps on there, like total creeps. I see people blocking people all of the time. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 another reason I have uh, a lot of, uh, you know, hope and, uh, you know, positivity for the future is because of technology. Like, I think even though kids are in public school and they're being, you know, taught lies and and nationalism and statism and all that kind of stuff you know you can't censor the internet right they all have access to the internet they have access to all these like you said periscope and instagram and snapchat and all that and so there is a relentless spread of information all the time right and so <clears throat> i think it's inevitable that given that free flow of information that the, the kids are going to realize that what they're learning is garbage <laughs> So, I, like, even right now, we should both have a Bitcoin QR code right here so that whenever anyone is watching this video in the future, they can scan our QR code and donate Bitcoin to us. And I, I'll go on Periscope and tell people that because they'll title their Periscope Ask Me Anything. So I'll go on there and I'll do Bitcoin promotion and talk. Hey, have you heard about Bitcoin? And then some of them you know, have, and then some people are like, that's a scam. And I'm like, you obviously don't know what you're talking about. You should read a little bit more, just like maybe one more web page. Come on, bring it <laughs> one more. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I, um, it's been a while since I explained Bitcoin to somebody who, uh, who had no idea about it. Um, but, but I like, I like the conversation because yeah, like you said, most people don't know or what they know is what they've heard on the news, which is oftentimes like, you know, trying to vilify it, right? Like, oh, those, that's something that drug dealers use, and and uh, what else? Um, you know, they talk about Mount Gox, you know, failing, and everybody lost all their bitcoins, and or or something was hacked or something. And I'm like, <clears throat> I'm like, all right, <clears throat> so that's something that you heard from a news source. So you're saying you're you're assuming that's true for the for everything about Bitcoin by one <laughs> or a couple of news stories. And then there's the lazy people who don't work hard enough to even secure their own Bitcoin and they complain about it. And I go, well, if you would have not put all your eggs in one basket, you would have access to this information or whatever it is that you don't have anymore. So there's that too, the, just the battling, I call it baby boomerism. It's like the yeah. defeatist attitude of not wanting to take that one extra step, like not wanting to learn that one thing more and just giving up and saying, I don't get it. I'm confused and it doesn't work. And I can't stand it. I call it baby boomerism. <laughs> yeah, recently um, <clears throat> I had blockchain.info a wallet there, and then I I got off that because that's uh, not recommended, right? Because that's like it's like it's like a bank or something. They hold your your Bitcoin there, right? And and, and it's I, like I forget what they call it. So, yeah, I guess like a bank. But so so I got Air Airbits. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Ver look, an online wallet versus a wallet on your cell phone. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So Air Airbits. I assume. But do you know if you have the private key in your Airbits? Uh, private key? Uh, no, I don't know. <laughs> Why? Yeah, it's a good question. Huh? I haven't checked ours either. That was somebody asked me that the other day. If Airbits had, if you have access to your private key, hmm. or does Airbits hold access to the private key? Hmm. It's probably something both of us should check in. Uh -huh. because, yeah. I mean, I told. And and 
Go ahead, Even go just having paper wallets printed out with Bitcoin on them and laminating them and sticking them in safes or burying them or whatever you got to do, you know, like, and the other cryptocurrencies as well, like Dash. I'm really excited about Dash. Dash? Never heard of that. Well, it's, uh, they have their own network and they also have like a decentralized um, government type of thing going on where you can write a proposal and the Dash network will vote to fund you. And the Daily Decrypt got like a week of her episodes funded mm -hmm. um, by writing a proposal on the Dash network. And when I first opened my Dash uh, client on my computer and got a wallet, I just went on a Twitter and I said, hello, people, I just <laughs> opened my Dash wallet. Does anybody want to tip me any Dash for my first Dash? And that's how I got my first Dash. I ne I've never bought any cryptocurrency. I've always either earned it or got a tip or a donation or something like that ah cool yeah yeah it's awesome you know and bitcoin is just one of like thousands of cryptocurrencies that's that's the other thing it's like you know people say well maybe bitcoin is not the future how do you anarchists know what the future is going to be why do you put all your faith in bitcoin i'm like no i don't put my faith in bitcoin i don't put my faith in gold and silver <clears throat> i put my faith in whatever the market decides right so i just keep mentioning the dollar <laughs> really come on do you like that dollar so much it's like awesome it's like it's worth it's so valuable come on people yeah yeah like yeah. silver is better to trade at this point your your bullion or your dimes or make silver dime cards and then now they have numismatic value because the art is so freaking cool so it's worth five dollars instead of a dollar sixty or whatever yeah, yeah, and then there's some people who think that uh, inflation is just like an act of nature. Like, yeah, yeah, we have inflation, you know, two percent. You know, the Fed's like, we, our goal is two percent inflation. Everyone's like, oh wow, that's wonderful, wonderful goal. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, like a translation. Our goal is to rob you two percent per year. Yes, yay! <laughs> Seriously, like we were talking about recently, how this, how this is literally a prison planet, literally. Like, you're in a FEMA camp. There's a camera on every street corner. You have livestock tags on your car. And, you know, the government has access to your bank account if you have a bank account. So they can pretty much do anything they want there. And so can the bank. Oh, God, it just creeps me out just thinking about, like, how <laughs> the little lack of control people actually have over their lives. And it's sickening. Yeah, I, I can see how, how easily it is. And I think I, I went through that. Uh, stage as well when I was learning about you know um, voluntarism and uh, capitalism and government you know you spiral down to the depths of depression and despair and gloom like there's no hope for us I just have to buy as much gold and silver as I can get toilet paper get a lot of water and just <laughs> sit in my corner <laughs> and wait for it to happen no <clears throat> and after a while you realize wait a minute that's not that's not a fruitful life. <laughs> and, then, and, 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 <laughs> and you're all like hiding in your corner. And, and, and how is that, you know, clutching your toilet paper? And, and how is that going to attract people to our philosophy, right? Because the way I look at it, like I, I like the way Adam Kokesh describes it, is like, you know, you want to make your philosophy seem attractive, right? You want to make it, you want to make it uh, or tell people that this philosophy makes you happy and content, right? And more loving, more gentle, more kind person. <clears throat> I think that's what something, you know, philosophy is supposed to do, make you a better person, right? <laughs> if it makes you a worse person, it's not such a good philosophy. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've been I've been met, talked to about my anger issues and <laughs> friends have called me out on it. So it's definitely come to the forefront. And I now, uh, you know, think about it almost daily still since, you know, it's good to call out your friends, hold people accountable. It's what makes us a better, per better people. Uh -huh. Um. But yeah, it's not always fun. It's not always easy. And sometimes you want to get on the defense and get angrier. But, you know, I don't know. We only live one time and it's really short. So we should not be angry or worry too much about anything. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Then, and then there's people who say, um, you know, how do you know it's ever going to happen? How do you know anarchy is ever going to happen or volunteerism? Everybody's not going to accept your philosophy, right? So why do you even trying? Okay? It's 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 fruitless. It's a waste of time. <laughs> it's a utopian I, vision. <laughs> and and go, go ahead. Go ahead. 
sorry i th- like at that point i just explain to people that like you all everyone exists in their own reality yeah so like in my reality i exist in, in an anarchy reality and if you exist in a you know a livestock controlled reality then yeah there's no anarchy there yeah <clears throat> yeah and the way i look at it is that um you know i live this life or i have these principles not because it's popular but because it's moral and it's virtuous and it's just and that's it you know it, regardless if you know if everybody decided to <clears throat> rob from each other and murder each other that still wouldn't make robbery and murder <laughs> a moral thing right it's not about how many people are doing it right it's about <clears throat> understanding universal morality right and uh and that's what i think my message has become is that even if you know in my lifetime i don't get to see what of what a truly voluntary society would look like you know um maybe it's like we're planting seeds for the next generation or the generation after that that's going to feel the shade from those trees right <laughs> and <clears throat> that's so that's my that's my goal right it's it's not even just about us because the same thing with the abolitionists in the, in the 19th century right a lot of them probably didn't see the abolition of chain slavery either but that doesn't mean it's a fruitless endeavor right if you see injustice in the world then you speak out about it and you shine light on it right and hopefully eventually you know if people will do that it will wither away and die Agreed. There's a lot of shady trees at Jackalope. <laughs> yeah, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a, a wonderful place. <laughs> Somebody planted them a long ass time ago, and and it's the story. If you go online and look up the Baca uh, family, that's Baca Meadows is where Jackalope is, and the Baca family used to live there, and they have a very large property there, and you can see it on the county website as well. Um, and there's like a a place where they're buried. But anyway, the Baca family, that used to be the main trail that travelers would go on when they're, I guess, going from Payson to Heber Overgard or Sholo or something. And the Baca family would house and feed those people while they were traveling down that trail. And so I kind of view, you know, Jackalope like that too, because when people come there, uh, they some of the vendors will cook food and you can just give a donation so mm. there's no like set price on what you're paying or anything like that and I'm pretty sure the Baca family took donations as well some people do set, set uh, suggested donation prices for items um, but some people don't and so I, I definitely feel like uh, you know the Baca family supports what we're doing there <laughs> in their in their past next whatever yeah. life yeah. <laughs> so, so. there actually is some members that still they they were there last year and ernie went and talked to them so awesome there are wow. some sur- surviving members cool so so um <clears throat> i'm sure the audience is uh, wants to know how many uh pages of registration and how many forms of id do you require for people to come to jackalope <laughs> zero <laughs> i'm sorry i couldn't finish that without laughing <laughs> <laughs> We have a deregistration table, so you can look for that when you get there. And there's a form. You can fill it out if you want. But I suggest reading the whole thing first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, an undocumented, uh, unregistered festival. Uh, I like the idea. <laughs> yeah, uh, non, a non-event. Non-event. And you're, not, and you're not the owner, right? You're not the founder. You're not the owner. <laughs> Definitely not in charge of anybody. Special agent not in charge. Excellent. But. I have a good mentor, you know, uh, Ernie's been really supportive of our non-events and cool. when I was contacted by the government back in year two, or before year two, um, he contacted them back and uh, for me and basically told them that there was nothing they were going to get from any of the people that attend there and nice. uh, the Forest Service came and they were really nice, and I wish I had documentation of that, a video of that. It'd be uh, really good for his for history, but yeah. uh, I don't. And we, but we've been left alone ever since. So, like, if somebody did come, even if it was some kind of like inspector or food or whatever, you know, they'd be treated just like that. Those guys at Pork Fest were last year. Right. So there'd be cameras, and everyone there is armed, and 
You don't mess with. <laughs> you just don't mess with a group of armed people. It's not a good idea, especially if they're not, you know, living by the or abiding by the non-aggression principle. Yeah, that's that. That's the thing. I think that's that's kind of the way uh, that laws are effectively nullified, right? It's not through petitioning to your congressman. It's not through protesting or you know um, making waves. You know, going and standing out in front of the uh, the Capitol building. No. <clears throat> You make them unenforceable, right? You make it afraid for the government agents to enforce the law, right? Afraid for their lives, right? Like, like uh, I remember Larkin Rose is saying uh, a great way to, to uh, a great experiment that should be done is uh, <clears throat> a couple of kids should go out and have their lemonade stand, and a couple of anarchists with with you know nice armed uh, <laughs> weapons there <laughs> should stand right next to them, and if any any agents of the state come and try to harass them, you know, let's see what happens. <laughs> And yeah, it, the lemonade stand, the the liberate lemonade or whatever. They should have been armed. I wonder if the cops would have screwed us on that. If they would have got arrested that day, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to just to point out the complete uh, lunacy, you know, of uh, of legislation. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's a that's a wonderful wonderful way. And that's exactly how uh, you know alcohol prohibition got. Uh, got you know overturned is by making it unenforceable right when nobody obeys the law then you know really there is no <laughs> there is no man-made law arbitrary you know you know by the barrel of a gun law <clears throat> right so but the, alcohol was like a trick though i think because they're like we're gonna you know you're not allowed to have this and now you're allowed to have this and it was more like a funnel to like funnel people there probably yeah, yeah, yeah. Could have been that, and also, also, I like to tell people is that um, uh, I think it was like nineteen thirty three, thirty two, thirty three, when like alcohol was just you know the prohibition was just lifted, and then and then gold became banned, and so <laughs> like the year before, if you had uh, you know a beer and a and a and a, a gold coin, you know. You would be a criminal <clears throat> because of the beer, <laughs> but in the next year, if you had the same two things, you're a criminal because of the gold coin. <laughs> oh my god! <clears throat> so yeah, yeah, that and like guns. Those laws, those laws, and guns are never. They're never gonna stop people, and no laws stop people from doing things they want to do. Laws don't stop people from doing things they want to do ever. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think if uh, people had that mindset <clears throat> in more and more in um, you know in uh, Nazi Germany and in Stalin Russia and uh, Mao's China, then less people would have been murdered, right? Imagine if those people were armed, <laughs> you know, if those Jews were armed in Nazi Germany, how many of them would have been escorted away, right? <clears throat> so, so the more you are, um, the more the less that you obey authority the less that you obey those you know claiming to have a superior claim on your life um the more likely you are following your morality and the more likely you are you know preserving your life <laughs> so <clears throat> it's i agree too, too often you know people can maybe go, go ahead, go ahead. maybe being a little more sane to having less cognitive dissonance Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. But uh, but yeah, I don't want to keep you any longer. I know you have your child there to attend to. So so please, um, uh, can you let let the people know um, again? Just plug your websites and how they can reach you if they want to find your work. Okay. Um, well, if you have any information that you want to add to Undocumented Human, like if you have an experience or a story or anything like that. I'm totally willing to collaborate and share information like that on there if anyone sends me anything. And all of the contacts, you can reach me through any of the websites. And um, also, so Jackalope Freedom Festival is August 1st through 8th, and it's in northern Arizona in the Pines. So if you do have to, like, fly or drive to the valley, it's not in the valley. It's up north where it's cool. It's not hot. It's after months soon season so usually the fire restrictions have been lifted and we do get donations for porta potties so that it's not a nasty whatever fest <laughs> and <laughs> nice um and then agris marketplace is a website where if you can if you accept alternative currencies mm. like a uh, bitcoin silver gold whatever barter trade it's free to get connected with other agris on there and I'm going to be adding a forum as well so that people can just communicate amongst themselves, which I should have done, oh, sorry, eight years ago. Would have been nice for 
uh, people to be able to, well, we, I have a group on Facebook, which I suppose is similar to a forum, but it doesn't really track topics like forums do, you know, and mm-hmm. you can put files in groups, but then you have to go to the file section to find those files. And, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Anyway, <laughs> um, and then what was, what was the other one? What was my other one? Oh, uh, I, I edit and write for the homestead.guru. And one of my articles about turmeric just went over 300,000 views. Nice. Awesome. So it was, it's like going viral and continuing to go viral. And my friends are telling me about it going, hey, do you know about this? And they show me their bottles of their pills. And I go, yeah, I know about that. I wrote an article about that. <laughs> you might have read it because, you know, people, the networks, our Liberty networks are not that, they're, they're large but there's still a niche. The homestead.guru, um, I work with uh, Kat and John, the Blush family. They also just launched their Patreon. They live in Austin or just outside of Austin, and they own Brave New Books. So if you're in Texas, uh, definitely go check them out. Um, same thing with Derek Bros. He's doing, like, a bunch of stuff in Houston, and he's looking for land and all kinds of things. There's all kinds of stuff going on everywhere. Um I guess that's pretty much it. I think I've given you all of uh, the websites. I'm working on a trail of anarchy, which is going to be a new website that will um, offer public events and then private events uh, for a membership fee. Um, the public events, the, uh, any kind of Liberty event that's public and, and anyone that has like a trail of public events can go and post their trail on there. Basically, like if Derek Rose or somebody or anyone, whatever, is traveling from one event to another and they're driving, they can go and put their trail on there and other people can meet up with them, market with them. Um, if they're staying in a camp area or an RV area that's near a conference that doesn't offer something like that for Agris because it's in a hotel or whatever, then that information will be listed on there too so that other people can cohabitate off of, you know, hotel premises uh, while an event is going on. And then the events that are free to camp then and attend will be like promoted extra special. So I really want to encourage other people to uh, do what I did and not be in charge of an event. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Be the, uh, the the co-creator of the event, maybe. But yeah, definitely collaborate with other people. Nice. So, um, and this show will be fun. There's always a jackalope hunt for the kids. So whoever wins gets a real rabbit, and you can either eat it or keep it as a pet. Cool. All right. Awesome. Um, so, yeah. so, so one other thing I'd like to ask my guests before we go is, um, what is your favorite quote of all time? Fear is the mind killer. Cool. All right. Awesome. I like it. Fear is the uh, the path to the dark side. Fear is the foundation of statism. <laughs> fear fear is a paralyzing, a crippling emotion that we should uh, steer very clear of. So, uh, when you're not fearful, when you're happy, then uh, you know. I think I think politicians cannot have control of your life. You know the you know the mind. You know you can. Well, I think it was uh, I think it was Gandhi that said. You know you can you can like uh, chain me up. You can beat me. You can whip me. You can you can put me on the rack, um, you know, but you can never enslave my mind. So something like that. <laughs> might, be, might be paraphrasing, but, <laughs> but I love Seriously, it. I mean, like, you can try and chain it up or put me in a cage, but you will never know, like, what's in here. Yeah. Even I don't know what's in here yet. <laughs> we're, all, we're all still trying to figure that out, right? <laughs> each, each I'm still learning. I know. Yeah, that's a good point. We are all still learning, definitely. And that's why and that's why force and coercion is, is very, very rarely justified, I guess, in, in, except in self-defense. But, but, you know, because we don't know what's best for other people, right? We barely know what's best for ourselves. How can we possibly know what's best for other people, right? It's a... It's an impossibility. Uh, it's a it's a fool's, yeah. fool's effort. Um, but if anyone watching this is in Arizona, I do have a, a Facebook page and group called Unschooling Arizona, and there's other families in there that unschool or homeschool, and they post all kinds of different events that go on in the valley, and 
So if you're looking to get connected with other people, there's probably over a hundred people or so in that group now. Oh, that's so important. That's so important for especially, you know, homeschoolers and schoolers to get connected with other people because you do not want to do that alone. I mean, you can, I guess, but it's just so much better with other people, you know, and, and the kids grow up with other people, all different mm -hmm. ages and just do various activities. And it's just, it's just a lot of fun, you know, so I, I definitely encourage that um, anywhere, anywhere people do that. <laughs> um, so off awesome conversation, Alma. Thank you very much for coming on. I really thank appreciate you. It. Um, no problem. Uh, so if anybody wants to help me out, uh, you can do so through Bitcoin, PayPal, or Patreon. Uh, links are below. Uh, Patreon.com slash Peaceful to help me out. Dollar show is all I ask. Um, if you find value in this content, please feel free to donate. Um, value for value, right? That's what uh, free market capitalism is all about. If you see something that you want to see more of in the world, you patronize it, right? You support voting with your dollars. The only democracy I support. Um, also, you can help support me through um, the Amazon affiliate program. Uh, I have uh, Amazon links on my um, on my website. Uh, you can check those out, and you, you purchase uh, products through those. Um, you, I will get a commission at no extra cost to you. So please feel free to use those if you if you like my content and you want to see me introduce uh, or interview more fascinating people like Alma here. Please uh, help me out. <laughs> so uh, awesome conversation, Alma. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Uh, Thanks. So this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.